Ian, thank you very much for your uh, welcoming uh, address and your opening statements there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight to uh, answer some of the questions that have been posed and hopefully to give you some information as to about where we are as a force and indeed where we are nationally around some, some key issues. Uh, I've made a note of all of the points that Ian's raised, many of which I'll cover in my sort of the body of my input, but if I can just pick off a few things now just to sort of clarify a, a couple of points there. Starting, of course, with compulsory sevens. Um, if I'm honest, I think that's coming. Uh, I don't think that's going to be avoided. I think the police service will have that. Uh, I'm not a supporter of compulsory severance. Uh, I don't think it provides us with what we need. But then this force is in a very different place to many other forces. Uh, because of the way that we handled our headcount management plan uh, in the very early stages of CSR1 and the reduction budget or the, the budget reductions we had to face during that period, uh, we're in a place where natural attrition uh, people leaving the organisation in the normal way gives us the headcount reduction that we need. I know from speaking to, to some colleagues up and down the country that is not the same in every force. And whilst I don't support compulsory severance, that mainly is because we don't need it. If we get to the point where CSR 2 moves into CSR 3, moves into CSR 4 and so on, that may be the case that in order to achieve the budget reductions, compulsory severance is the only way forward. I rather hope that we won't get into that stage, and I know from the state that we're in here in Kent that we won't get there for a number of years, so hopefully that, that deals with that, that question there. Neighbourhood policing, uh, you mentioned Ian, around the importance that we've placed on neighbourhood policing. We still do, uh, but I'd be naive in the extreme to stand up here in front of this audience to say that neighbourhood policing is as I envisaged it when we set off down the road of our changes uh, to meet the challenges of CSR1. It hasn't produced the neighbourhood policing that I wanted. I particularly wanted traditional neighbourhoods where officers were accountable for one, two, maybe three wards and able to interact with the communities and be part of that in the traditional way. The reality is, as you've described in the neighbourhood teams, because of the fact that we had to move uh, and reduce our, our workforce, have become a volume crime team. There's no doubt about that, and I, I, I take no, uh, no pleasure in commenting on that. That's not what we set out to do. The fact is, that's where we ended up. The, the volume of work that was uh, across the force has not reduced. I'll come on to demand management in a, in a little while. But the volume of work has not reduced. The workforce most definitely has. And it doesn't take a, a scientist to work out if we reduce our workforce and keep the same demand, then everybody's got to do more. Um, we are working very hard on demand management and I'll come on to some of the stuff that we're looking to uh, do and hopefully looking to achieve uh, to address that one. Do I still want neighbourhood policing? Yes, I do. I want neighbourhoods to be part of the communities that we serve and I know when Mrs Barnes talks in a little while, no doubt she'll sort of emphasise the value on visible community policing that is, is welcomed both here and indeed I suspect in every force. Can we afford it? That's the big question. Can we afford to keep neighbourhoods as a separate entity and response policing as a separate entity? I don't think so. And work that Neil Jerome is doing on my behalf is looking to see whether and how we can bring the two entities together as a single body and how they will actually work. That's in the very early stages of work at this stage and we really do, do need to understand how that will be delivered. Um, so we, we'll talk about a, a little bit more about the, the neighbourhoods when I talk about the challenges around CSR2. Reducing demand is a big part of that work that's going on. Um, if we know that our workforce is coming down and we know that we're not going to get any more money, I'll talk about money and I, I know Mrs Barnes will talk about money in due course, uh, then we've got to reduce the demand. Stop doing what is not our job. Make the people and the organisations that have responsibilities to do their work to do their work and not expect us to pick that up. And I've used this analogy at a, a number of meetings I've been to. We're different to the other public sector organisations, only in the sense that when the other public sector organisations have a budget reduction challenge, they stop doing things. So, for example, the, the county council, when as part of their challenges to achieve their budget challenges or budget reductions, they will close the library. They might get loads of complaints and moans and groans and letters, but they still close that library and that service ceases for that part of the community. We don't have the luxury of stopping delivering any parts of our policing services because that's what we do. 
And if you look at, and go back three years, uh, the Federation run a very, very um, high profile campaign around the budget cuts for challenges uh, for CSR1. The campaigns included some very impactive um, poster campaigns, but that didn't stir the public up to get in behind us and actually support the campaign to reduce and challenge the budgets at that stage. Why? Well, I would say because the public didn't actually see any, any difference to the service that they were getting at that stage. And that, I have to say, is, is a, as a result of the hard work, the exceptionally hard work that colleagues in this room and around the force do every day. So the public didn't see that. CSR2 is different. I think they will start to see that, and I'll pick up on some of the issues and the challenges that we've got when I get to that stage. So reducing demand is a, a big issue for us. You specifically mentioned, Ian, about the um, custody risk assessment paper. Uh, I welcome a look at that to see whether we need to do it in that way. And again, my challenge to the force is, look, tell us, tell me <coughs> what we're doing that adds no value to the delivery of policing services in this community. And if I, provided I can legally stop doing it, I will. But I need you to tell me about these things so we can pick that up. I'll take that away in specifically about the risk assessment. The mental health issues that you raised are a huge challenge for the policing service, not just for us here in Kent, but for the policing service. I know the Home Secretary has picked this up with the Health, health Minister, and there's some ongoing work at that level. But actually, we need to do stuff here in Kent to relieve the burden of our colleagues when they're sitting doing constant supervision for hours upon hours. And I've had anecdotal stuff, and I don't doubt that the, the, the details of this are, are not true, that we've sat with someone for 30 plus hours on a constant supervision when quite rightly that is not our job. We need to be dealing with people that are breaking the law and the cell block, as you rightly point out in, is for prisoners, not for people who are mentally ill and have illnesses. There are other agencies that need to pick up that work. We are very proactive locally. Uh, Mr Brandon on my behalf is engaging with the, the health authorities around what their role is. I've written a number of letters uh, to senior managers uh, within the mental health world to say this is simply not good enough. We cannot have people sitting in cells that need to be getting medical treatment. We are not medical experts, we are not trained in that arena, and we need to be doing our job and not everybody else's. To be fair, they've responded very positively. We have seen, uh, people in the room will probably be aware, we've, we've started a, a pilot in the east of the county with support from the Police and Crime Commissioner by providing the funding which provides us with a triage capability for people we think are suffering from mental health illnesses. The early indications, and it is still very early indications, is that is having a positive impact. Is it solving the problem? No, and we need to do more, more work around that. Equally, we've now got an agreement with CCAM that they will transport every person who's subject to a, a Section 136 mental health assessment. Uh, that's a big change. They weren't doing that up until this, uh, up until this week. Uh, and we've got that, that change as well. But we do need to be pushing quite hard with the other agencies around their work, particularly around mental health. There is no capability or very limited capability in the county to have those assessments done. And quite frankly, that's just not good enough. I know the Police and Crime Commissioner uh, and myself have been pushing quite hard to say we've got to have that improved. We are working on that, but that's not something that can be fixed overnight. <coughs> the shift patterns. Let me kill off a rumour immediately. No decision has been made about changing the shift patterns to a straight, straight seven, eight hour shift. No decision has been made to change that shift pattern to that, that one, which is quite frankly, not good shift pattern. You said, you used a quote there in, there are no great shift patterns, some are better than others. I would cha challenge that. I'd say there are no great shift patterns, some are worse than others. And there is no such thing as a good shift system for everybody. When you look at it from a business delivery point of view, then you're at one end of the spectrum as to what shift pattern is the best for getting that, that service to the community. When you look at it from the other end of the spectrum, which is those people who have to work it, uh, then there is no shift pattern that actually meets both requirements. We need to be somewhere in the middle. Of course, we've got to devise a shift pattern that allows us to put more colleagues available at the time with the greatest demand. And that work was done two years ago now when we looked at the shift patterns then. Uh, you, you challenged us at a meeting the other day, and, and quite rightly so in my view, around, well, the demand hasn't changed that much. 
So we need to look at where the demand has changed, if indeed it has, before we finalise any move away from the shift systems that we've got. It is really important that we engage and we have views from people that are being asked to work those shift systems. Now, I'm not saying for one minute that we will always go down the road of providing the shift system that is absolutely the best shift system for those people working it, because we do need to consider the delivery of that service. What I will guarantee you is that we will consult, and we will consult properly, and we will consult effectively before any decisions are made around shifts work. But again, I'll go back to killing off that rumour. No decision has been made at this time. That is part of the work that Neil Jerome is doing uh, for me and for the force in looking at how we're going to deal with the challenges around CSR2. If I go on to my bits, I've covered a lot of the stuff here. I want to talk about sort of a little bit of the journey we've been on. Let's not forget where we are. CSR1 provided us with a budget challenge of £50 million to find. £50 million. That is a huge hit on our budget. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we've achieved that £50 million reduction uh, in three years, not in four. So what that actually gives us is a, a, a gap year or a year where we can ease ourselves in to CSR2. CSR1 meant that we reduced our workforce by 1,200 people, nearly 500 police officers, 700-ish uh, police staff members. That is a huge hit on the, on the population that works for Kent Police. Has the workload gone away? No. Has the demand gone away? No. Has it reduced? No, not at all. What that has meant is that people are having to work harder and taking on more work. That is not lost on us, I guarantee you. We then move into CSR2. I mentioned before about the, the impact on the public. The public have not seen any impact on what you're doing for them. When they've needed the police, we've been there and we've provided a first-class service. If you look at the surveys, uh, the satisfaction surveys that we undertake, the satisfaction surveys are at a very, very high level, high standards. And what that means is people out there with additional workloads are delivering a fantastic service to the communities of Kent. And I am very, very grateful for that. So what does it mean for CSR2? Now, although we haven't got the finalised figures, we're fairly confident we know the ballpark numbers that we're playing with. And with the, the best case scenario is that we've got to find £17.5 million. Pounds. That £17.5 million pounds has got to be found in the year 15-16. We've got a gap year, as I say, so we can use that year to soften that landing. The worst case scenario is that we've got to find £24.5 million. Pounds. So what we've done is we've plumbed down the middle and said, right, let's start working our plans up around <coughs> finding £20 million. Pounds. Now, £20 million pounds in crude terms amounts to hundreds, and I mean hundreds, 200 plus police officers, if we stick with that. Now we will look at all of the other budget challenges, we'll, we'll look at every budget head, and there's no budget that won't be turned over to say, right, where can we find some savings from this? But the bottom line is, we're in the ballpark of finding an additional £20 million. Now work your way down the road to the end of that when we found that money, what we've ended up doing is taking £70 million out of this organisation. There is no organisation that can provide the same quality of service minus £70 million, and we're no exception to that. This, I think, is the time when we'll start to see, we'll move away from creaking to the point where you quite rightly say, Ian, we cannot deliver our service in the same way that we have, have done in the past. Uh, credit to uh, everybody in the organisation for the way that they've responded to CSR1. CSR2 does take us in a different place. Uh, I know that with the support uh, and um, help from the Police and Crime Commissioner and her office, we are working towards um, challenging the great and the good, the politicians, to fully understand what the impact is of taking £70 million out of our organisation. Uh, we have a meeting next Friday uh, with the politicians and the uh, councillors of the, of the county where I will be giving them a presentation and Mrs Barnes will be presenting her views on what minus £70 million means to the communities of Kenya. Because after all, that's what we're here to do. We're delivering our services to the communities of Kenya. That impact of that presentation, I hope, will see the politicians line up behind myself, line up behind Mrs Barnes, in our quest to get some money from either precepting or other places. I'll leave Mrs Barnes to talk through the issues, issues of precepting, but in support of what Ian said earlier, you will get my full support, Mrs Barnes, uh, with a view to how we can manage the preset uplift to support the force 
reduce the impact of the £20 million budget challenge that we face and thereby by provide the quality service that we all want to deliver to our communities here in Kent. I'll move on to the, the need to reduce demand. Uh, and Ian is absolutely right. If our workforce we know is going to continue to reduce, we need to reduce the demand or else we just will not meet that challenge. The platinum service that Ian talked about I think is right. We've enjoyed giving the platinum service. We're one of the only forces in the country, if not the only force in the country, that currently still attends every crime. We cannot afford to do that in the future. We are looking now at how we can stop going to every crime and manage some of them crimes by a telephone investigation. That work has been fired off, that I've agreed that with the Chief Officer team that we're going to stop going to every crime. Give us a bit of time to just work out how we then manage those crimes. My thinking is that we'll develop a telephone investigation team and they'll pick off some of the sort of lower end of the criminal sort of world that we need to, to investigate uh, and that will hopefully give some respite to colleagues they don't have to go to, to every incident. Um, so that's part of it. We recognise that having a separate entity around both a um, neighbourhood policing team and a response team is probably a luxury we cannot afford any longer and we're looking to bring the two teams together in one single entity. Now that itself brings some challenges. We know that um, <coughs> we can't have the same working practices uh, if you bring those two teams together. So we're looking at how that will work. We're looking at how we will deliver that service by bringing the two together. Ideally, I would like to keep them separate and give the neighbourhoods sort of the prominence and the response teams the prominence that they need. But quite frankly, we just can't afford that, so we're going to have to bring those together. We will look at every budget head, as I said, to see where savings could be made. But we also need to push back on some of the other organisations who are expecting us to do their job. Some of the areas that we're pushing on that is with the local authorities. I've mentioned this before around noise nuisance. I really want local authorities to pick that up, but we might need to work with them to let them come and work in our part of the business, so in other words working in our control room, uh, to get them to respond to that rather than us send it to officers there. The other areas are around, I know that the Department of Work and Pensions uh, were using us to go and get warrants and go and um, do arrests on their behalf. We've stopped that now, we said no, that's your job. We will get involved in those arrests if it is of some benefit to us. So if it's someone that's on our, our uh, watch list, for want of a better term, then we will go with them on that, but we're not taking on their, their roles. Uh, Ian mentioned about the role of the control room, and I think he's absolutely right. Regularly when I go to uh, meetings with the public, I get challenged about, not about the lack of policing response, I actually get challenged about, I reported a crime, I was very, very happy with the service that I got from the control room, I didn't want to see a police officer, but one turned up. Why are we going to jobs? when we don't need to. Let's kill that off and deal with that very, very quickly. Now, there may be some jobs that we want to go to even if the victim says, actually, I don't need to see the police. For example, if it's part of a series of offences, you're investigating those offences and you might get uh, some intelligence or information by going to see that victim, I'm very comfortable with that. We should make that decision. There is no point in us going to see victims of crimes when they don't need it. Equally, I hear uh, uh, plenty of uh, anecdotal information about people phoning the police to give us information. Uh, they don't need the police, but we still go around. Uh, it's quite frustrating to hear that, and I know it must be even worse for you when you're, you're going to these jobs. We are looking at that as part of the work that Neil Jerome is doing, to say, let's not go to the jobs that we don't need to do. The platinum service is very nice, but can we afford it? I don't think so. The appointment car, when we introduced that some two years ago, was exceptionally uh, positive and very, very well received by the communities that, that, that we were serving at that time. And indeed we saw a very positive impact on that in our satisfaction surveys very quickly. Now they liked the fact that we went round, we made appointments, we, just didn't, we didn't just turn up, we made appointments and we went round there. But here's a few statistics, I'm not a great believer of statistics, but here's a couple of statistics. We go to about 120,000 appointments each year. Some of the work, the early work that uh, Neil Jerome and his team have done has identified that we could probably reduce that by 40,000 appointments if we managed our time better. So in other words, we're not going to every crime, we're not going to incidents where people don't actually want the police, they're quite happy to be dealt with over the phone. So we're going to look at that, you know, that's a third of those appointments that we would stop doing. And this is not going to happen overnight, 
uh, but we are looking at these to make sure that we can bring demand down. The telephone investigation unit that I spoke about I see as being uh, a key part of this, this work. Uh, it's very early days in that, we will move to that, but we need to get our processes and our systems in place so that we do in fact investigate that rather than send officers around there. Um, the platinum standards, I think, is a great analogy there. You know, we would love to provide that platinum standard to the communities of Kenya. With £70 million out of our budget, we actually can't do that and we need to do things in a different way. Um, I'll move on to the, the role of the Police and Crime Commissioner very, very briefly because I know she'll want to talk about this. Um, one of the ways of reducing the impact of our budget reduction is the precepting. And that's not always a popular thing with people around the, the county of Kent, but if they want the sort of service that, that they tell us they want, it may well be that they need to pay a little bit more for that service. Uh, and I know the Commissioner will talk about that, but I'll just reinforce the fact that we will provide any support that the Commissioner needs in order to get that precept in at the level that allows us to deliver our service. I just want to touch very, very briefly on performance. Uh, it, was, it was mentioned by Ian, uh, and he's absolutely right. We've moved a significant distance between now and, and last year. Uh, this time last year, we were right in the throes of the HMICs, so, or the HMIC were looking to come in. We did our own reviews that was mentioned by Ian there, and we learned a lot of lessons there. Uh, it identified to us you know, some very positive things. There was no inherent corruption uh, around the force. There was no sort of wrongdoings inherently around the force. But there were some activities that were going on that whilst did not breach the law or the standards, and I used, for example, the, the chase for detections uh, and people going for t cannabis sort of detections rather than the burglars. Um, was it against the law what they were doing? No. Was it against the rules what they were doing? No. Burberry, uh, sorry, uh, having cannabis, as we all know, is an offence. Is that really what we wanted people to do? No, it isn't. We want to chase the burglars, those people that cause us the greatest harm. We've moved to who a huge distance on that. I've done away with all the numbers, right? and despite the fact that we made it very, very clear, there will be, there should be no numerical targets for anybody in this organisation. We did away with them in January, I believe, and stopped those numerical targets. But that didn't mean to say that performance is going to stop. When you come into an organisation like this, we get held to account for service delivery. Service delivery is performance. Is there any uh, numerical targets? There should not be. And as Ian said, if you've got them, or you're having them imposed on you, please let me know and we will deal with them. But performance is not a dirty word. You know, we still have to go out there and deliver our service. I expect everybody to do you know, their job. And if I go to detections, whilst we've done away with the, the numbers around detections, so 34.2% or 34.5% or was it 35.4%, I forget, whatever the percentage was, has gone. That doesn't mean to say that we're not going to detect offences. My expectation is we would look to detect every offence that is detectable. Every offence that is detectable. And that doesn't matter whether that's 35.4% or 30% or 50%. If it's detectable, I expect people to go out there, we're the police after all, and start detecting them. One of the challenges, one of the pushbacks I got when I said take away the numbers, and I'll tell you now, it was a difficult thing to do. And I've been in the job a long time now, and numbers have been part of our performance culture for as long as I can ever remember. We've had these arbitrary figures given to us, and it isn't just locally, let me tell you, they've come from governments, They've come from police authorities, they've come from senior police officers uh, to down there and get these numbers. Moving away from that was a huge challenge. You know, there's still some people in this organisation, and I know, that find it difficult to manage their people without having numbers rattling around. The numbers haven't gone away, by the way. The numbers are still there, but I expect managers and supervisors to use them as management tools to understand what their teams are doing, not to set figures. The pushback that I got was, yeah, that's all very well while we're delivering against our performance targets. What happens when crime starts to go up? Are you going to reverse that and reintroduce the, the, uh, the numbers game? Well, let me tell you, we're at that place right now. I sit in front of the Police and Crime Commissioner every Monday morning, where part of the conversation we have is around performance that's going on in, in this force. I sit in front of the Police and Crime Commissioner every eight weeks in a public meeting, where part of the accountability that I have to give is around our performance. Performance around service delivery, performance around crime and detections. 
Crime is going up in this county. We've seen that start to go up over the last six, seven months. Have I been put under any pressure from the Police and Crime Commissioner to go back to numbers? No. Have we decided as a, an organisation to go back to numbers? No. Why not? Because it's not the right thing. Numbers are not important. Service delivery is important. Now, of course we want to bring crime down and make Kent a safer place as it can absolutely be. Of course we want to detect as many offences as, as we can. But that doesn't mean to say that we do that at any cost. Integrity is not negotiable in what we do. We pride ourselves on being a fantastic organisation that delivers fantastic things. And that includes being an organisation that has integrity right the way through. It is much easier for me to sit in front of Mrs Barnes uh, or anybody and, and explain why our performance is poor in crime reduction and how that's going up. It is not easy for me to sit in front of her and say, we've done this, we've achieved this, um, these performance results, but there's no integrity in the organisation. So that's stood the test of time. Please, if you've got numbers, then please let me know. Let me just sort of conclude by saying thank you. This organisation is a fantastic organisation. Kent Police, despite the challenges that we've had over the last 12 months, the last two or three years, budget reductions, has stood the test of time. You are delivering an outstanding service to the communities of Kent, despite the budget reductions, despite everything else that's been going on, Windsor, one, two, pre uh, the pressures on pensions and all that sort of thing. People are going out there and delivering some fantastic stuff. I was at an awards ceremony last night, and I have to say, it, it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up when you listen to some of the stuff that our colleagues do every day. You know, that's despite all of the other bits and pieces that are going on. So I'd like to thank you uh, for your support uh, and your continued delivery of, of a wonderful and fantastic service to the communities of Kent. My final point is just to reinforce what Ian said. I welcome your support and engagement and your offer for support and engagement, Ian. You are absolutely right. We can do this, but we need to do it together. There is no point in me imposing things on the force. I need to be part of that discussion, both with the Federation and the colleagues out there that deliver the service, and indeed with the Police and Crime Commissioner. Your offer of support and engagement is welcomed, and I'll certainly take that up. Thank you very much.